I think we will just start. Um, there's a few more people to come in. But uh, my name is Mark Schmidt. I run the political reform program here at New America. And I want to just welcome you all to, to uh, this uh, event, which we're hosting with the American Constitution Society. And we're always thrilled to, uh, to partner with, with ACS, which is an organization that was started about the same time we were and that is, we've overlapped with in, in, in many ways and done a lot of a lot of really great uh, events with. So we're really glad to have you all here. Um, today's event is on rethinking the, the the Supreme Court, potentially reforming the Supreme Court. And for us in the in the political reform program, we were thrilled to host this because these are a set of issues that we don't work directly on, but we find that in everything we do about reforming American politics, we're constantly bumping up on and being aware of of the Supreme Court and its role in in around voting rights, potentially around independent redistricting uh, commissions, obviously around money and politics, potentially moving into an era where we will not only be looking at Citizens United, but some of the original um, uh, reforms of the of, of 1974 potentially being uh, being at risk. So it's a period where I think the uh, the Supreme Court is political in a way that's not entirely new, but it is in in our history. But it is it is different. You know, thinking about uh, Justice O'Connor announcing her retirement yesterday, kind of represents a, a, a different era where you couldn't necessarily label every single justice based on their uh, based on the party of the president who had appointed them and instead we're moving into a situation where you know the Supreme Court is in many ways reinforcing for generations to come the political situation at the, at the time at which justices were appointed um, and yet at the same time which we treat it as this entirely sacred and untouchable institution so I think the uh, I'm really excited to have a conversation here which will which will not treat it as an untouchable institution and actually think about how we make it a more effective ally of both our rights and our democracy. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kara Stein, and, and uh, uh, we'll continue the introductions and get the conversation started. Thank you all for coming. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us for this important and timely discussion on reforming the court. Um, as Mark said, my name is Kara Stein. I'm the Vice President of Policy and Program at the American Constitution Society. And before we get started, I would like to thank our friends at New America for hosting this event. We are very grateful for their hospitality. For those of you who don't know ACS, we are a national network of over 200 student and lawyer chapters in almost every state and on most law school campuses. Our members are lawyers, law students, judges, policy experts, legislators, and legal academics who shape debate on the key legal and policy public, public policy issues of our time. And since you came here today, I'm guessing that like me, many of you have been avid Supreme Court watchers for some time. Before there was a SCOTUS blog that kept you up to date and you could refresh your screen all the time on your phone like this, and I know who you are, so don't judge. Um, I actually had the uh, May It Please the Court audio collection on cassette tape, okay, aging myself. So you could hear all the oral arguments of the greatest hits of the Supreme Court. And I don't know about you, but these last few months, um, and frankly the last few years, have been quite discouraging for those of us who care deeply about the court as an institution. Uh, as the nominations process has grown increasingly contentious, norm upon norm has fallen by the wayside, and I, for one, have not even recovered from the refusal to grant Merrick Garland even a hearing, and would never have imagined that we would see a nominee take to the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal to make his case. So we've arrived at the point where many are asking if the court is just another partisan player in our political system. To discuss that question, we have an all-star panel today. Our moderator, Kim Kimberly Atkins, is the chief Washington reporter and columnist for the Boston Herald, where she covers the White House, Congress, and the US Supreme Court, of course. She is also an MSNBC contributor and a recurring guest host for C-SPAN's morning call-in show, Washington Journal, where she interviews lawmakers, public policy experts, and journalists about the issues of the day. And she is no stranger to ACS. We are delighted that she's here with us again today. Please welcome Kim.
Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We're glad that there's a great turnout for this really important discussion today uh, about the US Supreme Court uh, and asking the question, what reforms, if any, uh, are needed to the court for all the reasons that Kara uh, so uh, clearly laid out. Um, discussions about how and whether to change the US Supreme Court are not new. They have been going on since the beginning of the court. Uh, but I think there have been uh, three recent developments that have really brought that conversation to the fore uh, in a way that we uh, haven't seen before. And one was the, the, there were the, the, three, the last three nominations to the US Supreme Court. President Obama's nominee of Merrick Garland, who did not get a hearing. Uh, President Trump's nomination of Neil Gorsuch, who took the spot that a lot of people think belonged to Merrick Garland. And then the most recently, uh, the very, very contentious nomination process around Justice uh, Brett Kavanaugh that just wrapped up recently. And so I want to get to the experts to really talk about these issues, how we got here, how they see uh, the problems with the Supreme Court and the nominating process. So we're going to, uh, on the end, we're going to start with Aziz Huck. Uh, he is a professor of law at the University of Chicago, where his teaching and research interests include constitutional law, criminal procedure, federal courts, and legislation. Uh, before joining the faculty, he was associate counsel and then director of the Liberty uh, and National Security Project at the Brennan Center for Justice uh, at NYU School of Law, uh, litigating cases at uh, all levels, uh, including the US Supreme Court. He's also a former clerk for Judge Robert D. Sack of the US Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit and of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the Supreme Court. Uh, next to him, we have Bob Bauer. Uh, he is a professor at NYU Law and co-director of the Legislative and Regulatory Process Clinic there. Uh, Bob's 40 years of practice uh, has included providing counseling and representation on matters involving the regula regulation of political activity before courts and administrative agencies of national party committees, candidates, political committees, individuals, federal <coughs> office holders, and more. He served as White House counsel to President Obama and returned to private practice in uh, 2011 uh, and was also general counsel to Obama for America, the president's campaign organization in 2008. Amanda Frost is a professor at American University's Washington College of Law, where she writes and teaches in the field of constitutional law, immigration, citizenship law, uh, federal courts and jurisdiction, and judicial ethics. Her writing has appeared in numerous academic and news publications, uh, and she authors the Academic Roundup column for SCOTUS blog, which we all read. Um, before entering academia, uh, she clerked for Judge uh, Raymond Randolph on the US Court of Appeals uh, for the DC Circuit and worked as a staff attorney at Public Citizen. She's also an alum of the Senate Judiciary Committee's uh, legal staff, and that all will come to bear in our discussion today. Um, and finally, we have, uh, and last but not least, we have Ganesh Sitaraman. He's a professor at Vanderbilt Law School, where, he is, uh, where his current research addresses issues in constitution, administrative, and foreign relations law. He took leave from Vanderbilt from 2011 to 2013 to serve as Senator Elizabeth Warren's policy director during her campaign for the Senate and as her senior counsel in the Senate. Uh, before joining Vanderbilt, he was a law clerk for Judge uh, Stephen F. Williams of the DC Circuit uh, and the public uh, law fellow and lecturer at Harvard Law School. I could go on all day listing all of their accolades and publications. They're in your material, so I, uh, I invite you to check that out as we have our discussion. But I want to get started, and I'm going to start with you, Aziz, to give you all an idea of how we got here to this place where we are asking these existential questions about the US Supreme Court and the way uh, the justices are <laughs> Uh, confirmed to the court and the makeup of the court itself and how it's governed. What do you think got us to this place? Uh, the, the court has always been a political entity. It has, it has always been an object of uh, uh, contestation between political parties and has played over time an increasingly important role in the republic. There are moments in time where the court has uh, become aligned to one pole of the political spectrum 
and has pursued uh, uh, policies, uh, and the pursuit of policies is inevitable in the exercise of the Supreme Court's jurisdiction given the kind of cases that it has. Uh, it's pursued policies that are closely aligned with that poll. Uh, the sheer fact of the association of the court with one poll in the political spectrum creates a situation of tension between either the political branches and the court or the court and the general public. In my view, there are two ways of thinking about reform of the court. One is to focus upon the personnel of the court. Uh, the other is to focus upon the power of the court. Uh, my own view, and I think I, I differ from other people on the panel here, is that uh, a focus on the personnel of the court is a mistake, and one ought to focus on the power of the court. All right, Bob, what do you think? My focus today, uh, and it will bring me to, I think, comment uh, on uh, Professor Hook's position here, is that we need to adjust our understanding about the way we think about the court. We need to alter our understanding of what norms are appropriate in guiding uh, the court's understanding of itself, guiding our understanding of how nominees are selected and confirmed to the court. Uh, as said in the introduction, we have this notion of the court sort of as a citadel, it's a highly protected entity. Uh, there are all sorts of norms that serve to place the court at a distance, if you will, from I, I think certain principles of accountability. I should mention, I think one of the dangers in this discussion is one becomes aroused to discuss these matters only when something happens, a decision is issued or a confirmation process yields a particular result and it angers one side or the other. But I think both sides, if they think about uh, the way in which I think the norms have become, if you will, unaligned over time, both sides can agree that reform of the court and beginning with uh, adjustment in our understandings, our expectations, uh, the, the practices we expect of the court, uh, all of that is overdue. And so just let me say very, very briefly, and because I do want to brief here and I'll come back to all of this, uh, take the example of uh, lifetime appointments. So you have a court that is extraordinarily powerful. Presidents uh, nominate uh, uh, justices to the court. They may serve only four years. They may nominate the courts uh, with whatever level of public support they have at the time. And then they are in a position to exercise influence over the constitutional law of the land for 40 years or more. Maybe 40 at the top, but certainly for a very long time. And yet we have a norm that suggests that they're entitled to their choice barring some major disqualification, barring some personal disqualification. That's a grotesque mistake. It's absurd to argue that a president of the United States is entitled to a choice uh, with deference, essentially substantive deference, to whatever ideological judgment the president has reached, whatever jurisprudential preference the president has, with a consequence that spans decades. And so that whole deferential norm has created all sorts of distortions in the process, including, of course, enormous pressure on the Congress to look purely to personal deficits because of fear of contravening that, uh, that norm of deference. And I'll have more to say about this uh, when we talk about the advice and consent process. And then the question is, to what extent can you translate these concerns with what I think are outdated norms into reforms that are legal in character? What does it mean to try to do that and with what consequences, both intended and unintended? Okay, Amanda. Uh, yes, I wanted to pick up on the point that Aziz made about this being maybe a bifurcated issue. Do we change the court's personnel? Do we uh, impose term limits? Do we add to the court's numbers, pack the court? Um, that's one set of questions. And then to what degree could Congress regulate the power of the court? So, um, but I may differ a little bit from Aziz. I am not a, a fan of necessarily court packing or term limits. And I think with term limits, we would need a constitutional amendment. That said, I am not opposed to talking about it and talking about it publicly and loudly in lots of different spheres of our political and public life because the court is listening. And while uh, FDR, rightly I think, his plan to pack the court was rejected, um, I think that conversation, that public conversation had an effect on the court and I think it was a useful effect. I think the court is never completely and nor should it be divorced from the current public views of its decisions and certainly the court, the evidence shows, does follow the will of the people to some degree. And if a very conservative court, let's say in five or 10 years, is very much out of step with what I hope to be a more progressive American society, who knows, but then I think, I hope it listens when people have conversations about packing the court or term limits. Not because I think we should institute them, but because I think it should listen to the people's dissatisfaction. 
Um, I am a fan of, of smaller scale reforms, and I'll talk about them in some more detail later, but just to throw out the kind of things I'm talking about. Um, things like the recusal laws, which right now I think are very ineffective, allow each justice to decide for him or herself with zero accountability or even transparency, no reasons given. That's one small example. Another example of ways in which the, co the court could uh, have some of its decision making change would be to have a more open or transparent certiorari process. We could even change the voting rules. How many justices do you need in the majority to overturn a statute as unconstitutional? Um, we could have lots of conversations about these smaller tweaks to the court's power. Okay, Ganesh. Well, thanks so much. I, I think that at this moment, uh, the Supreme Court faces an extreme crisis in its legitimacy. Um, I think that's the case for a few reasons. The first is a process set of reasons. Uh, we had a Supreme Court nomination process uh, for uh, Judge Merrick Garland that resulted in him not receiving a vote. Uh, and many people uh, in the country, um, one might say you know, about half who pay significant attention to politics, uh, think that that seat uh, is a stolen seat. Um, we have a second Supreme Court justice, uh, now Justice Kavanaugh, um, who no one thinks is a stolen seat. Um, it was you know, President Trump's uh, to fill by right. Uh, but the process of which was so toxic and so corrosive that, again, some 50% or so of the people who pay significant attention to these, these kinds of questions um, think that it is an Ill illegitimate uh, person to be holding that, that seat. Uh, we, so that's a process problem. Um, the second problem the Supreme Court has is a partisanship problem. We have a 5-4 Supreme Court in which the five and the four are more consolidated uh, than they have been in decades. Um, justice Kennedy is probably uh, the last justice we can expect to, in any significant number of significant cases, uh, vote in a direction that, that his um, uh, appointing, president, uh, uh, appointing president's party might suggest uh, th th that he's, he's contravening. Um, and this is a big shift. Uh, you know, even when FDR was facing the four horsemen who were striking down uh, New Deal legislation, um, there were Democrat. There was a Democrat in that group. It was not a solely partisan question. Uh, Justice McReynolds was a Woodrow Wilson appointee, um, so it was Republicans and Democrats who were who were striking down his work. That in the case now, if we see a future Democratic president um, and we have a five-four Supreme Court. Uh, it will be the four Republican, the five Republican appointed justices striking down legislation from a Democratic president uh, over uh, the, the dissents of four democratically appointed justices. Um, that is a partisan problem uh, that is significant and different. And the reason why I think that part is a problem is part of what it does is it makes the court look like a group of political hacks who are voting for politics, not supporting what the is. And part of what makes our legal system and the rule of law itself work is our highly salient uh, entity in the justice system is the Supreme Court. And people believe that it is um, a legitimate organization that is working on the rule of law and that is trying to be neutral. Um, an important part is not seen uh, and has not generally been seen as consistently just a group of political hacks. Um, that is a big threat, I think, going forward for the court as well. Uh, and I think this legitimacy problem for the court means that the court has to significantly change if what we want to do is save the court's legitimacy um, from what we can predictably expect will be a long uh, list of kind of five, four decisions along partisan lines that, that are coming forward. And as we talk, I'll, I'll give some criteria and suggestions for how I think we might do that. And I want to remind everybody that we're going to uh, allot plenty of time at the end of our discussion for your questions. And I really want you to be thinking of them as we speak. Uh, and we will get to, to as many of them as we can uh, at the end of the program. So just think about that and hold tight on that. Uh, and sort of diving deeper into this discussion, I want to first spend some time talking about uh, the makeup of the court itself and potential changes to that. Uh, Ganesh, you were talking about the idea that the court is very political. I was talking to another reporter recently, and we were remarking about how 10 years ago, we would never refer to a justice as Democratic appointee or Republican appointee. We would just say Justice Souter, Justice whomever, or Justice Roberts. And now, not only is that done more uh, routinely, um, but the implication of that seems to almost always be borne out, that we do have justices that are 
more or less, in many cases, you can predetermine what their vote is going to be before a case is even argued. And so, you know, that brings us to the idea of the court itself. What changes uh, can be made to the court to make it less political, to reinforce more trust into the process, and to take uh, the politics out of it? I know just in your introductions, you've talked about things like term limits. I know that this 18-year number is one that's very popular uh, that goes around, or, or biennial appointments, or uh, changing the numbers of justices on the court, changing the way the chief is selected, or how senior justices are rotated. What are some of these ideas, and what are there? Might they work? Might they not? And, and why? Well, you can start, Bob. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in with one thought, which has been expressed elsewhere, and that is we currently have a, 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 a court that I think has particularly invited, and maybe in some respects unfairly, the suggestion that is partisan. I, I, I'm not of the view that all of the justices, even when they cast votes that are predictable, given their backgrounds and the presidents who nominated them, I'm not convinced they view themselves as acting politically. That I'm not at all convinced of. But I think the court, contrary to the view that it may have recovered from this episode, really turned a certain corner in the public perception with Bush versus Gore. But I think there the issue was not, in many respects, I know there'll be significant disagreement about this, that five decided they wanted a Republican president and four would have held out for a Democrat. But because of an extraordinarily aggrandized view of its role in the middle of the situation. There's a constitutional procedure for addressing these matters. There are state recount procedures. There are admittedly messy, potentially very volatile constitutional processes for accepting the electoral vote count for the states and sorting out contests, sorting out uh, unresolved outcomes. And the court, and this is the strongest argument that's been made on its behalf, saw itself as the guardian of constitutional order and stepped in in a way that I think really raised uh, significant issues of legitimacy. The thought was, well, their approval ratings mounts back afterwards. You know, we're very public opinion focused. I'm not certain that that didn't have a dramatic effect over the long term on how the court was viewed. But I see that, again, partisanship stemming from the absence of robust norms that govern how the court itself views the exercise of its own power. And I'll just uh, close by saying this. I wouldn't mind to see a court with more membership drawn from, if you will, categories of lawyers with experiences definitely different from the ones who currently sit on the court. We don't need necessarily um, elite, uh, educated, experienced appellate judges from Harvard or Yale uh, packing the court, having spent their time going to, if you will, ideologically uh, sort of reinforcing conferences and discussions among themselves. I think you know, some of the Hugo Blacks and the Earl Warrens wouldn't be bad additions to the court to address some of the concerns that I'm expressing. In other words, in some sense, a more political court, more sensitive to the role of the court in a democratic society. And in the past, we have judges who've come from different places. I mean, Justice O'Connor was a politician before Precisely. Uh, she was on the court. But you, you, I think you had a point. Amanda. Well, yes, and I was just going to say a, a related point about the, the fact that the, while the nine may be split along the partisan lines of who appointed them, they are remarkably alike in a very problematic way. And in particular, that many of them have worked for the executive branch, and that's been a significant part of their background. Which to me, with my, I have a lot of concern about abuse of executive power and the courts playing a role in checking that. I'm concerned, whether it's Elena Kagan or Chief Justice Roberts, to see that when, you, when you're a lawyer and you occupy, occupy a role, you take on some of the values of that role. That's without any question. It's just human psychology. And I, am, I would love to see a court that was more diverse in its background, including people who'd seen law at the trial level. And I hear trial courts say they'd like that as well. Um, and people who just bring a more diverse life experience to the court. So would some of these proposals, I mean, whether it's changing the amount of time, ending uh, lifetime appointments, or changing the number or the way the court is arranged, get to those issues? So, so I think that the place we need to start in thinking about court reform uh, proposals, at least the big structural ones, yeah. is to have some criteria of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and I think there's at least four things that we want to accomplish. One is we want to tamp down the politics. Uh, we have a political process that is highly partisan and highly toxic around this. Um, it is political hardball. We want to lower the temperature of the political stakes of every one of these court fights. Uh, a second category is that we want to address the fact that 
effectively the constitutional law of the country is being determined by a set of random occurrences, which is retirements or deaths of justices that happen in unpredictable times. Um, and no one would think that the right way to design a system is based on the longevity of individual octogenarians. That is just not how you would think <laughs> this is a sensible way to design a system of, of, of uh, finality in constitutional law. Um, a third criteria is that any proposal has to be constitutionally plausible, um, though not necessarily constitutionally bulletproof. And what I mean by that is it needs to be plausible that you could enact it by a statute. And the reason why is it's highly implausible that given our polarized system, you're going to get a constitutional amendment. Um, so it needs to be constitutionally plausible. Now I say not constitutionally bulletproof because there's room and it's probably unlikely that the kind of big reforms you might think of um, are, are bulletproof or, or in a very conservative constitutional sense, but there are plausible arguments and there's some that are more and less plausible. Um, and then the final uh, criteria is it needs to be something that is possibly stable. So even if in order to pass it, it would be a highly political and partisan uh, thing. Um, once it is passed, whatever the reform is, you would ideally want something that both sides could then agree on as reasonably stable going forward. Uh, so you don't have massive institutional swings every four to eight years. Uh, so with that criteria in mind, um, here's how I see uh, a couple of things. I'll try not to, to filibuster too long, though I did work in the Senate, so it's kind of, <laughs> uh, it is one of those things that, that seeps into your, yourself, um, especially if you're an academic. Uh, but, but let's take 18 years, for example. Um, the 18-year plan solves some of these things, but it actually does not solve the political problem. Um, if you have 18-year terms for justices, it is highly likely to make the political problem of the court worse, not better. Because at the end of 18 years, well, first, let's start at the beginning. When you appoint justices, it still will be a highly contested political process. Every single election will be about the future of the Supreme Court because each president will get two judicial appointments on the Supreme Court. Every campaign will be about it every, two, every time. Every, every presidential campaign will be about this question. Then you're going to have the judges on the court. Um, they'll be on the court for 18 years. And I suspect they might want to become more political, not less political. And the reason why is at the end of 18 years, excellent things for justices to do might be run for Senate or the presidency, become a commentator for Fox News or MSNBC and rake in lots of money, become a lobbyist on K Street. This might make the justices actually worse in this direction rather than better, something that people don't really uh, talk much about who are the advocates to the 18-year plan. So I think the 18-year plan is not a good one, does not meet this core criteria. Um, a second one, packing the courts, uh, has some complicated effects. It's not entirely certain what that one would do. On, on the one hand, it seems very problematic in stability terms. Um, if you imagine that Democrats coming in uh, in, say, 2021 would try to pack the court, add some additional Democrats, well, it's possible Republicans then in the next Republican administration will pack the court again, and we will have a tit-for-tat, constant expanding court. Um, so that fails the stability criteria. Now, this may or may not be the case. Um, and the reason why is throughout our history, as some people have pointed out, Bruce Ackerman, Jack Balkin, there have been these big moments where politics, including constitutional law, gets fundamentally realigned. So in the event that there was some sort of realignment moment, it is possible that there would then be stability around a new Supreme Court um, that is composed of a kind of packed Democratic court um, or a packed Republican court in the future. Um, but, but it's very unpredictable for us to know if that kind of realignment moment is going to happen in advance. Um, those are only really identifiable after they've already happened. So it's sort of hard to tell if that one will be stable. So there's some pros and cons there. Um, one of the positives on the, on the packing the court that is a negative of the 18-year plan uh, is packing the court, most commentators think, is constitutional because the size of the court has changed over our history. Um, whereas most people think the, I think most people think, I think it's fair to say, the 18-year the plan is on much more dubious constitutional grounds um, because people have generally understood the Constitution's requirement of good behavior to mean lifetime tenure. Um, uh, I'll say one last thing. Um, I've proposed a couple of uh, additional ideas that I think satisfy these, uh, these criteria with, with a professor at WashU named Dan Epps. Um, and, and what we propose is first that uh, a system of a lottery where instead of having nine justices um, uh, as we currently do, we appoint all of the Federal Court of Appeals judges as associate justices of the Supreme Court. 
Um, and then the way the Supreme Court uh, would hear cases is in panels of nine, randomly selected from the full set of, of uh, Federal Court of Appeals judges. Um, we could talk about the details if people are interested. Um, there's a lot of details to that. Um, the second idea is that we switch the court to having 15 judges, justices, um, five uh, you know, partisan uh, uh, Republicans, five partisan Democrats. We have a lot of commissions, for example, that have partisan balance requirements. Um, and then five additional judges uh, taken from the Court of Appeals um, that the other 10 have to, by consensus, agree to. So it would force the 10 to pick five that they can all agree with, um, and those would just serve for a year. Uh, and you would have much greater rotation in who's on the court. It would significantly uh, decrease the uh, impact of any particular nomination. Um, and again, doesn't have life tenure problems. So happy to talk more about each of those in the, in the Q&A. Yeah, uh, I have a lot of questions for that. First, I want to give Aziz a chance to, to jump in. So uh, you can imagine uh, a world in which Merrick Garland had been appointed uh, to the court. And there was a discussion of precisely this kind that was happening, but at the Heritage Foundation. And there was a Ganesh Sitaraman for Ted Cruz, <laughs> making exactly the same arguments about legitimacy and making proposals about how to restore the court. Right? And the discussion that would be occurring at New America and in ACS would have a completely different tenor. And it would be a, a, a ginning up of reasons why the kind of personnel-based proposals that uh, I, I think Ganesh was really smartly and sharply articulating and exploring in these really innovative ways were wrong. That ought to be a clue that we're not talking about the right thing. My view is that the reason that we are having this conversation is that the court is a powerful political actor with preferences over policy that it has the power to enact that are predictably different from ours and predictably regressive, extremely regressive. And this is not just a function of President Trump's appointments. It's been true certainly since the early 1970s. To the extent that liberals believe that the court, the Supreme Court, and I think one ought to distinguish between the function of a constitutional court at the apex of the judiciary and the function of lower courts that deal with retail adjudication. To the extent that liberals believe that apex courts are important to the achievement of the substantive, moral, and normative goals that they believe are important, they are wrong. It is just not the case that the US Supreme Court has, as a historical matter, pursued progressive policies. It has, it, there has been a period from 1955, 1954 perhaps, <laughs> up to 1972 where that was somewhat the case. But to say that the Supreme Court is somehow necessary for the maintenance of our democracy, to say that it is necessary to defend the individual rights of citizens or non-citizens uh, in an era in which most of the court's jurisprudence of remedies has been making it easier to take those rights away, right? I think it's just, it's just false. My own academic background includes a comparative constitutional perspective. If one looks around the world, most constitutional courts are created not because the founders of a constitution want to somehow protect the vulnerable or advance progressive agendas. Constitutional courts are predictably methods of entrenching powerful elites that existed before a constitution was ratified. That was true in the United States. The court was predominantly federalist, right? It was identified with a political party for the first 15 years of its life. And then the, the first big political battle over the courts was an effort by the Jeffersonians to destroy the federalist lock on the judiciary, right? So, so this notion that, that somehow courts have ever been apolitical, that they've ever been progressive, except in 
peculiar moments where being progressive advanced a Cold War agenda, which is what explains Brown, right, is just wrong. So my view is that if one wants to address the problem that's on the table, you need to depower the court. And there is a long history of Congress enacting statutes that limit substantially the authority of the court. Two examples of that. First, we all take for granted, or at least the lawyers take for granted, I think, that the function of the Supreme Court and the federal courts generally is to decide questions of federal law. Well, that wasn't true for 100 years. Right? In fact, the federal courts didn't have what's called federal question jurisdiction. They were given it in 1801 by Adams in a Hail Mary pass in the last days of his administration. And the Jeffersonians promptly took it away. And it wasn't restored until 1875, right? So the idea that it's the job of the federal courts to resolve federal questions is a latecomer. It is a post-Civil War idea. Second point. The idea that the court has some sort of free-ranging mandate to pick and choose the questions of federal law or constitutional law that it decides is, again, a very, very late idea. For a hundred and, depending on how you count, 130 years, when a question of federal law arose, usually it would arise in the state courts, the Supreme Court, by statute, was only allowed to hear that question of federal law if the state court had decided against a federal right. It was not permitted to hear the case if the state court had decided in favor of the federal right. The general point is, that Congress, over time, has exercised an enormous amount of discretionary control over what the court does. There is nothing necessary in our constitutional scheme in a court that has the degree of power that the court today has. Changes to the court, reform proposals to the court, that focus upon personnel rather than power, fail to address the core question that animates liberals and progressives. They are disingenuous in the way that uh, FDR's court packing proposal was disingenuous and was criticized as being disingenuous. Right? Everyone understood what that was really about, and that was a limitation, a failing on, uh, on FDR's part. Um, but, so they don't get to the real issue. A and they stumble, I think, further over the fact that they preserve the key role of the Senate, a body that, because of the demography of the states, will predictably tilt to the right for the near term. Indeed, its tilt to the right will increase over time. So for, that, for, for, for those reasons, my own view is that a, a progressive agenda, on the, on, particularly on the Supreme Court, and I'm distinguishing the Supreme Court from the lower federal courts, has to be one that's focused upon power, not personnel, and has to be focused on taking power away. And I want to bounce off of that, particularly the idea of, of the role of the Senate, but I want to give everybody a, a chance to respond to Aziz before we move on to talk about confirmation. So can I make a couple of, of specific responses? Um, so first, uh, you know, I, I think you press a, a, a good case, um, and, uh, you know, I, I, wish I, I wish I had the accent, because I feel like my case would be better <laughs> If I did. I, I, got, um, I got mine from a breakfast we, cereal box. Yeah, that would be Cap great. Captain Crunch. Maybe I can get one there. Um, but, I used to but, say Captain Crunch. One, but, yeah. yeah. Um, but even, in, in, even with, that, uh, with, that, um, with that arm tied behind my back, uh, here's, here's, here, here's what I'll say. A couple of things. First, you know, Aziz, one problem with the power approach as you, as you define it um, is it does not solve the problem of what happens when the shoe is on the other foot. You can jurisdiction strip the court today, and then the next administration and the next Congress can give it back its jurisdiction. Um, these are done by statute, and they do not lead to a stable system over time, because all the ways to strip power, as you said, you know, the Federalists put it in, the Jeffersonians took it out, the Reconstruction Republicans uh, put it in. I mean, these were partisan things happening as administrations 
changed, that will not shift. Um, there is a big difference, though, I think, between personnel, as you framed it, which I do think the court packing plans uh, fall into that category um, more cleanly, and structural reforms to how the court operates. Um, so the, 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 the lottery proposal, for example, that, that I've put forward as a structural reform um, would also significantly shift the power of the court. It would do so because you would not have cults of personality around justices. They would be randomly selected on our proposal that would be around for two weeks at a time in which they would hear cases. They would largely be court of appeals judges their entire term changing the cu culture of how they operate, how they think about precedent, what their role is. Um, so those are things that as well can change the power but also potentially are stable in a way that power shifting moves like, that are statutory um, are equally subject to political change. Uh, so, so I'm not convinced that we can get around that problem. And it may be that the answer is, you know, for, for someone who believes the courts should be less powerful in, in our constitutional system. And I think Aziz is right that uh, progressives and liberals have been too um, quick to think that the court is the entity to save us from uh, from politics we don't prefer or to advance the cause of justice. Um, he is right that that has rarely been the case in American history. Uh, it may be that both is some sort of an answer, um, but the idea that it's just the power side I'm not, I'm not convinced of in a world where you have to think that um, you know, both parties at some point will have unified control over government and whatever system you set up needs to be stable across that kind of shift. I wanted to give anybody else a chance to Go jump ahead, in. Follow. Yeah, I'm just quickly going to say, you know, Aziz, I have a lot of sympathy for some of the points you made. But here's my, I just want to get this on the table. We did see a personnel change to the court by Congress. It was when Merrick Garland was not confirmed. They, by that action, took the court down to eight, which had major effect in a couple major cases, right? So they controlled the size of the court. And then the Republicans got the person they wanted on the court. So I feel like we just watched over a course of two years a personnel shift in the court by one political party. And I'm a little reticent to be like, well, the, the Democrats shouldn't take their turn if they get it. Now, I agree that's sort of tit for tat has not gotten us very far. But I'll just say we've seen a personnel shift in the court, and the Republicans accomplished it. So for my, so for my part, I don't know that there's a, it has to be an either or. Uh, that in some sense you can't worry about the power of the court and at the same time worry about the process of personnel selection. I think you can do both, but I have to go back again to this issue of norms. I don't know that we can ever escape them. So for, I happen to agree with Ganesh that it is a problem to rely on, say, jurisdiction stripping practices that are just going to invite a cycle, if you will, of constitutional violence around what the court's jurisdiction is. Uh, so the question has to be what's inside and what's outside the bounds of the way we think about the court and the way we deal with questions of the court's authority, how it's cabined. Uh, two quick points, one about Garland and the other one um, on the subject of lifetime appointments. To me, the fundamental norm violation in the Garland case was not that Republicans were compelled to vote for Barack Obama's nominee to the court. I mean, I happen to think that the president, President Obama made the decision to put forward somebody they had unanimously supported before, who hardly represented a Bolshevik threat to the republic, and might have potentially drawn some Republican support. Uh, but uh, McConnell completely foreclosed that possibility. The norm violation, in my judgment, was shutting the process down completely. If at the end of the day a Republican wanted to make the argument, I'm not going to support any nominee of Barack Obama's, and even Mary Garland is, frankly, just too liberal for my taste, that's the argument they're going to make. They answer to their constituents. They answer to their consciences. That's the way in which they chose to exercise their advice and consent authority. The obliteration of the process was a massive norm violation because what you want is argument. You want nominations to be put forward, the Congress to advise and consent, hearings to be held, floor statements to be made, people to take positions, something that we saw play out quite dramatically uh, in the Kavanaugh case. Uh, whether even though the, the, that's, a, that's a depressing case in many respects and we can talk about that later, so the norm violation there was to say, we're just going to shut the process down completely and suspend our responsibility to advise and consent. By the way, that's not the first time in the constitutional history of the United States that a majority party has threatened to do that. It is the most striking instance uh, in which it has done it, just as sort of a matter of majority leader announced principle. 
the second point I want to make about norms is lifetime appointments. Um, we have a reason completely without regard to how partisan we think the court is or whatever, not to have justices serve uh, you know, into their late 80s, uh, and particularly to have no transparency whatsoever into their continuing capacity to serve. Several years ago, and Lee Druckmann somewhere around here, he picked it up in one of his columns. There's, there's Lee. I had made the suggestion that uh, when John Roberts was before the court, and John Roberts has expressed concern about how long justice has served, he might have been asked by the Congress as part of its advice consent authority, will you commit to us that you will only serve on the court for X number of years or in whatever range we identify? Could have been asked. Could be a routine question that justices are put, are, are put to justices. Roberts is not the only justice who has expressed uh, sympathy for the idea that justices shouldn't serve forever. Justice Souter did as well. That question's not even asked. I don't know whether it's considered impolite, right? <laughs> Uh, sort of a, an act of actuarial violence, you know? Um, but it should have been asked, and it wasn't asked. And so, I, again, I have to come back to the idea that some of these problems be, are, are, are a function of outdated ways of thinking about the court and interacting with the court that I think have reinforced some of the court's um, worst practices and expectations of itself. And so bouncing off of that idea and talking a little bit briefly uh, about the process of how justices are, are chosen, uh, and confirmed, I is that where the change mechanism is put in place? I mean, how would any of the proposals bring, you know, bringing back and constitutionalizing the filibuster, uh, uh, giving Congress more power essentially to regulate the process about how justices are selected uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, confirmed, how will that change things, particularly given the fact that the Senate, uh, the Congress, uh, just like the executive, are political bodies. There's going to be politics involved in this, no matter what the rules are. Anyone? You want to start, Bob, since you were I, talking about I, it? I'll be very brief about this. I think that what we saw in the Kavanaugh case was the complete absence of any kind of credible process for considering publicly supporting examination of the qualifications of Supreme Court justice. If you look at the Judiciary Committee rules, for example, there's nothing there. Essentially, these matters are left uh, to the determination of the majority. And so you saw this, that one day Thursday hearing was really quite extraordinary. I mean, you know, a lawyer in the, brought in by the majority who was sort of essentially dismissed mid-hearing and five minute rounds of questioning and no other witnesses permitted. That sets up a precedent that I think uh, Congress could in a world where there was some dialogue of, with the public sort of general constitutional concerns in mind, uh, the majority minority could agree on a set of robust procedures that would, but frankly, serve both sides that would prevent the Senate from so seriously embarrassing itself and would greatly aid both its advice and consent function and the perception that it was discharging that function responsibly. And how would you do that? What would those rules look like? Well, so a number of, glad you asked me that question. Um, <laughs> Number of, number of things. Uh, first of all, there needs to be a process by which when complaints come into the Senate or tips or information, there needs to be a process for logging them and circulating the information within the committee with robust protections for anonymity, at least in the first instance. There are none. There needs to be an understanding of when a special counsel would be appointed, particularly on contested issues of qualification. And if a special counsel cannot be agreed to by the majority and the minority, there could be a default requirement that the FBI on an independent basis is called upon uh, to conduct the investigation. And the independent FBI investigation is the one that determines the scope, not the majority. I think there could be rules around the hearings and precisely how they're conducted to provide at least some guarantees of appropriate airing of these particular issues. There needs to be some understanding of what the so-called burden of proof is. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt or preponderance of evidence. These are not trial court procedures. These informations are for the use of the senators in judging the fitness of someone to serve. And I think that needs to be clarified because the public was badly confused on that point. And last but not least, there needs to be some means for understanding the record on which the Senate relied in making its judgment. This notion that there's a room somewhere that people go in and out of, and as they come out, they sigh or they smile, and you're supposed to understand what there may or may not have been of consequence in that record, it doesn't reflect well on the institution at all, and it's certainly a blow to the transparency of the process and raises questions about how the public in turn can judge whether the Senate properly discharges its advice and consent function. Okay. Can, I, can I just build on, on something that, that Bob said? 
uh, that goes to the plausibility of these reforms, but also builds on, on his point about norms. Among legal scholars, there's a mystery about why we have norms, uh, why we have uh, practices that are not attended by any punishment or sanction for their violation in the context of political life, right? And it turns out that we have, have many of these norms. And the standard explanation for why uh, norms exist, it's not the only one, but it's, the, it's a pretty standard one, is that participants in the process uh, perceive of themselves or perceive themselves as a group, say a party, that is engaged in a iterative, repeated process of interaction, right? And they know that, as others have pointed out, the shoe might be on the other foot uh, downstream, right? And so norms persist uh, on the assumption that we are in an iterative game where there's going to be movement back and forth. And the reason that norms break down, or one of the reasons that norms break down, is that one side of that iterative game thinks, oh, I can, I can actually change the rules of the game, and I can move out a set of, uh, of options that were on the table. I can slice them off in a way that benefits me, right? Or I can, I can stop playing because I know that I'm, I'm not really at risk of being uh, pushed out in later rounds. Then there's various reasons why that might happen, but that does appear to be what has happened today, right? And you can call it polar partisan polarization or uh, uh, the, the sort of the politicization of the general culture wars or what have you. But the idea of this iterative uh, uh, expectation of repeat play appears to be have become much more fragile, right? Where with people, if you'll pardon the pun, being more willing to play a trump card. In a, in a way that sends the game off the rails in one, in one round, right? And this is, I think, what happened with Garland. It's, ha it's what happened with the Thursday Kavanaugh hearing uh, also. And in a world in which people don't have those long-term expectations, in which the key players don't seem to have those long-term expe expectations, I think that there's something mysterious about uh, thinking that we're going to get back to a place where it's not just that people will have long-term expectations about how this game will be played, but they'll be willing to write those down in the form of rules that actually have bells and whistles and sanctions attached to them, right? So the, I, 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 I'm very sympathetic with a lot, with, 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 with a lot of these ideas. I, I actually don't think, though, that my proposals are any less un, un, unstable than any others. But I think that there's a deep problem of motivation across everything that we're talking about. Because it is the very conditions that have created the problem that make the kind of solutions that we're talking about feasible. You know, I just want to point out that if we're obviously focused on the Supreme Court today and here, and, and so we'll keep it there. But to the degree that we're talking about taking away power from the Supreme Court, I think then we're talking about giving it to the lower federal courts or the state courts. And I have seen that same partisanship and politicization of the courts happening at the lower levels as well. And we're already a country quite divided by regions and red states and blue states, but even you, know, you look at the map and it's, it's regional as well. And so, it's, and of course our courts are regional courts, right? They, the state courts obviously have the jurisdiction uh, over the state and then we have the circuit courts controlling various, the law for various regions. So I'm sort of, even though I'm also a fan of thinking of maybe smaller ways to regulate the court, including this idea of changing jurisdictional uh, control, their, the scope of their jurisdiction over various issues, you know, you have to think what will happen next. And what will happen next is then we've got maybe battle over the composition of the Fourth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit and the attorney generals in each district rushing to bring their cases to the favorable court, which we see some of already. Now, I want to, and, and just a reminder, in about five, ten minutes, we're going to get to questions. Um, so be thinking about that, uh, but I, I want to uh, get to that issue, including um, uh, the jurisdictional sh uh, changes that uh, you brought up. But first, I, I want to drill down a little more on this issue, because watching this, writing about this, um, it just seemed very clear that the Senate had control over these nomination processes in a way that we didn't really think about before. And, and there, there was an increasingly uh, a growing division uh, in the votes, for example, confirmation votes of justices, where we went from uh, Justice 
uh, Scalia, who was confirmed unanimously, and Justice Ginsburg, who was confirmed nearly unanimously, unanimously through Justices Roberts and Alito, or became more, uh, you know, a, a lot less lopsided to now we have Kavanaugh as the, the closest uh, vote in modern history. But along the way, there was the erosion, the erosion of the filibuster, and then the alt-right end of the filibuster, and then these new rules that came in, um, you know, the Biden rule and the other thing, whatever uh, 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 Leader McConnell would think of that day. And then, <laughs> you know, and this idea that, well, advise and consent means we're going to allow outside groups to create a list, and the president just picks that, and we know that the members of the Republican-run Senate is going to love it, and so there we go. How, talk a little bit more about that, the Senate, and how they're in the position to make or change the rules at any time. And is there a solution to that? Because the same will happen if we have a Democratic president and a Democratic control Senate, right? So this isn't just a partisan issue. This is a process. It's a structure issue. My own view is, and these things don't occur immediately. Uh, you know, politicians, everybody winds up in the aftermath of an experience like the Kavanaugh experience, sorting out what it means and drawing their own conclusions about the institutional costs and the political consequences and the like. And that story has yet to be told, and the first iteration of the story is not likely to be accurate or longstanding. But I, I do think we can expect that Senate practice will change under political pressure uh, in the light of how those institutional actors determine the significance of this experience for them and for the institution. Um, the, it's, I, I do th there's no other way to deal with it. I mean, the Senate clearly can do all sorts of things in the guise of its advice consent responsibility, including what Mitch McConnell did unto Merrick Garland, right? Could do it. Nobody could stop him from doing it. And the same holds for the change in the filibuster rule. The question, again, is what people can tolerate. And in, even in this last round with Kavanaugh, and I cannot imagine a case made for the integrity of the fact-finding process in this case, nonetheless, the reason there was a one-day hearing and the reason eventually there was even any kind of an FBI inquiry as inadequate as in many respects as it was is because there was a body of senators who didn't think it was plausible to have the hearing con uh, conclude on any other basis. Now, we can argue whether it was a sham or not, so forth, but there's something there that I think over time could influence the way the Senate looks at these issues. But do I think it's going to happen overnight? No. The, the Senate over time has played a very different uh, role uh, and it's changed from period to period. So there's been about 155 or 56 nominations of justices by presidents since the beginning of the Republic. And overall, about one quarter of those nominations have failed. But the rate of failure has changed dramatically over time. Uh, it was somewhere south of 70% for the first 100 years of the Republic and then went up to about 85, 86% for the 20th century. So uh, we actually have a, a tradition where the Senate is, is, a, is a much more aggressive uh, uh, gatekeeper on presidential choice with respect to the Supreme Court. Uh, what appears to be driving that, if you look at the patterns, is the fact that we had uh, the same party in the Senate and in the White House through much of the early 20th century. And that party tended not to be ideologically uh, singular in the way that parties are today. There were, there were cross-cutting ideological issues uh, with respect to econo economic issues and, in particular, racial issues. And, and so that, th those conditions appear to have made it, uh, ma created a, a, a situation in the 20th century, a political constellation across the 20th century, where what you described at the beginning, Kim, of this, this much more uh, laissez-passe approach to the confirmation process, and Bob also talked about, um, uh, uh, set in. But there's nothing historically inevitable about it. It depends upon the existence of united versus divided government with respect to the Senate. And it also depends, uh, to an extent, and this, I'm going back to something I already said, it also depends upon the ideological homogeneity or variation within the party. The more ideologically homogenous the party is, the more you're going to get the kind of process you've seen in the last few uh, decades. So let's, let's backtrack to this issue of 
uh, rules that govern the way the justices operate. And I wanted to kick that off with, the, with Amanda's uh, uh, suggestion about maybe there are ways to change the jurisdiction, uh, the jurisdictional pow power of the court. Um, there's everything from the way the justices recuse themselves or don't recuse themselves uh, to transparency issues with respect to the certiorari process or, or the people, the um, amicus, uh, amici who come before the court. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so there's a, there, first of all, there's a long history of threatening jurisdiction stripping without actually doing it. Um, there's been some examples of actually doing it as well. But I think that goes to a point I made really early on, which is sometimes I think these are great conversations to have, even if I personally, were I to have a vote, wouldn't vote for it. Because I think the conversation kind of perks the ears up of the nine people on the court and makes them think twice. Um, they, I, I, my limited experience, in my limited experience with judges, they are very, very aware of the public opinion of their court and of them. So they are paying attention. Um, and so they would listen to this debate and it might affect them. Um, so a couple of the, of the, what I, the non-personnel changes, um, as Aziz puts it, would be jurisdiction stripping. Examples in the past are worry me. So things like take away school desegregation cases from the federal courts, take away prayer and school cases. These were threatened, never actually done. The obvious goal to get a result they wanted. Um, I'm not a fan of that at all, but there is an argument for, I think, a point Aziz was making. Just give them less power all overall. Maybe less power to control their docket, more mandatory cases they have to take and cases they can't take. There's no reason that they should have the ultimate power they have now in just about every case that comes through a state high court or federal court of appeals to decide if there's a federal question whether they want to take it or not, which is the situation they're in now. Um, so that's one example of restricting their power or changing their power. Another would be voting rules. To what degree do you, what's, that, what's the size of the court needed? We could talk about the size of the court as nine members, but we could also say maybe to strike down on constitutional legislation, they need to get two extra votes, not one. And in fact, that used to be the way it was. The court used to be an even number, six members. So to strike any piece of legislation down, they would need to have four in favor of doing that against the two opposed. Um, that's another thought. We could change the uh, ways in which they sit, the, the rules in which they're, this is Ganesh's point, the ways in which they sit currently. Some people have said there should be panels of, of justices, not the full court every time, or grabbing from the lower courts, or having the justices serve on the lower courts. Um, anyone who thinks this is constitutionally questionable should remember that the first Congress, um, and for quite a while, the, the justices were forced to ride circuit. So they actually served on the lower courts and had to get on a horse and sleep in inns and share beds with you know, the lay people who uh, had to open their homes for them so they could hear court cases in the courts uh, in various regions. They hated it. Um, uh, and, and it was not a fun part of being a justice. But it reminds you that Congress has a lot of authority to regulate the work of the Supreme Court. Anyone else have thoughts on that? I mean, I, I mean on the issue of writing yeah. circuit, it, I find it fascinating that a lot of the recent uh, Supreme Court retirees are doing that for fun um, a after they left the court. So it's obviously something that is feasible in that way. But I any other ideas about ways to rein in the power of uh, the justices? What, what about the, this idea of recusal or applying uh, ethics rules um, to the Supreme Court that apply to uh, other appellate court justice justices but not them? Well, since I've written on that, I will, yes, I'll just keep talking for a little bit longer, and then hopefully others will jump in. I, I mean, I think, and I'd talked to a bunch of, of um, Judiciary Committee staffers about this at one point, and they were, and I respected this, very reluctant to appear to be interfering with the Supreme Court. But I honestly thought too reluctant. Because, um, first of all, we do have a recusal statute that applies to the Supreme Court, 28 U.S.C. Section 455. But the way it operates, I think, is really problematic. Each justice decides for him or herself whether to recuse, there is no reason given, which is, I understand why it might be tricky to actually articulate the reason. It could be embarrassing publicly to say it in some cases. On the other hand, it means that there's absolutely no norms or baseline standard for recusal. Um, and there's absolutely no accountability or oversight. None of the other justices are ever involved in that decision. And I think that's problematic. The code of conduct, which applies to all the other lower federal court judges, does not apply to the justices. They claim to follow it, but if you look at what they do, and this applies to you know, both the folks appointed by Republicans and Democrats, they don't. So I think that's another area in which the court has a little too much leeway and Congress could rein it in. 
I, I, I completely agree with all of that. I think, again, it goes to the question of the various ways in which we communicate an expectation of the court about what kind of an institution it is. I'm reminded that when the late Justice Rehnquist uh, was approached by a reporter who asked him questions, well-founded questions about his health and whether he was going to resign, his answer was, it's none of your business. And there's a little bit of this, it's none of your business, that shapes the way the court looks at these kinds of outside inquiries. I happen to support, I recognize all of the, all of the arguments against it, but I happen to support the idea of having Supreme Court arguments that are televised. Uh, maybe some Supreme Court justices will, um, will be uh, motivated to become show people. We, we've had examples of that. Uh, but so that's what they'll do. And maybe there'll be lawyers who I think, by the way, for a variety of reasons, would be disinclined to do this, who will be show people. But it doesn't seem to me that there's a reason why the public, which is certainly not going to spend a lot of time reading through <coughs> your average, dense, deeply footnoted, largely abstruse, mostly incomprehensible constitutional adjudications, <laughs> might benefit from just hearing the matter discussed in the courtroom. Why should that not be generally available? And the court's response, quite strikingly to this argument, has been, including one former justice who said that the argument that Congress should impose this requirement on the courts was an attack on its independence. It's an attack on judicial independence. And that, the attitude encapsulated in that objection, I think, is one that we ought to significantly resist. And, and I would just add, you know, for people out there thinking um, in the judicial independence set of arguments that this is a, a grave separation of powers problem for Congress to be involved in anything related to the Supreme Court, um, there's actually, we can be very, very strict textualists about this. Uh, the Constitution itself in Article 3 gives Congress the power to set regulations for the judicial branch and to set up the judicial branch. The Necessary and Proper Clause, specifically by text, gives Congress the power to do anything necessary and proper to implement any of the other powers vested anywhere else in the Constitution. Uh, the judicial power is vested elsewhere in the Constitution, so therefore the Congress has power to implement that through the necessary and proper. So there is very specific textual arguments that Congress has the power to do a variety of things here um, that you know, is a pretty high bar, I would say, uh, to presume that some unspecified sense of judicial independence around television watching or um, any number of these other things that we've discussed uh, is obviously unconstitutional. In fact, it's a pretty strong argument that Congress has significant power to do this. Um, it is right there in the text. Okay. Uh, I want to get to your uh, questions. Uh, I just ask, we have a couple of folks with microphones that are going to be walking around. Uh, just for the sake of uh, those who may be watching remotely, uh, I want uh, to ask you all to wait until you get the microphone before you begin asking your question and briefly tell us uh, your name and where you're from. So uh, we'll start right here. Yes, you, yeah. hang on, wait for the microphone. Hi, uh, my name is Steven Spitz and for organizational purposes for this question, Merrick Garland went to my high school. <laughs> Um, my question is, why in the world, and this is particularly addressed to those who were involved in the Senate at the time, didn't the Democrats actually do something like refuse unanimous consent until Mayor Garland got a hearing? Uh, as Bob was pointing out, what McConnell did was absolutely outrageous and unprecedented to say that I, I get to unilaterally decide to hold up a Supreme Court nomination for a whole year just because I feel like it. Why wasn't there pushback by the Democrats on this? So uh, I don't think any of us were in the Senate at the, at the time <laughs> or, or, or working there or otherwise uh, involved in the process. If someone was, they should feel free to pretend they weren't and ignore the question. Um, <laughs> But, but I'll answer by saying, by, by saying this. There is a big literature in both political science and law um, now about, uh, and this is not a, a direct answer, this is a hypothesis answer, because I don't have direct knowledge as to, as to, uh, as to answer your question. Um, but there's a big literature in both political science and, and now um, uh, public law uh, showing that there is an asymmetric um, uh, exercise of what, of what people call hardball 
um, in this context. So it tends to be the case um, in an asymmetric fashion that at least in recent years, Democrats have been less willing to play political hardball or constitutional hardball uh, than Republicans. Um, the particular reasons for that, I'm not entirely uh, certain, but this has been a this has been a kind of documented thing that pretty consistently there's been an asymmetry on 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 the use of these kind of tactics. Over here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jim McCormick, and uh, my profession is human cognition. So I was really excited to hear Aziz talk about how the Nash equilibrium. Uh, establishes itself or dominates and really we understand the science of how to prevent that from happening and go go towards a more winner you know win-win solution but I guess my question is really going in the other direction a couple of times we brought up the idea of a balanced court an even number of justices so I'd like to hear the opinion of the panel panel on the idea of uh, gridlock as a way to leave those issues on the table for citizens and states when the justices or even the Congress can't get the will to come together and overcome their differences. So, uh, go ahead, please. No, 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 no go ahead. So, so one way of thinking about the growth of judicial power, particularly in the 20th century, and uh, 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 if, you, if, you, if you're really focused upon the, the judicial power to uh, reach constitutional rulings, the evidence suggests that that power is only exercised in, in a numerically significant fashion after the Civil War, starting in the, in the, in the 1880s uh, onward, right? That's when it takes off, right? If you're interested in, in why the courts exercise that power, it's not necessarily because the courts themselves initially wanted that power, right? What happens is there are powerful national forces in the post-Reconstruction era, principally new national corporations, that find themselves hindered by, uh, by uh, local uh, uh, laws that constrain them, laws that are produced by populist movements, by the Granger movement, rate-setting laws. And they, they see in the, in, the, in, the, in the national courts a vehicle for resisting those courts. And that's how we get judicial review. This is, in some fashion, uh, the criticisms of Citizens United are, are inapposite because judicial review in a numerically significant form comes from corporate mobilization at the national level. After that, what we see is a variety of national political actors seeing in the court a useful instrument for achieving policy ends that they don't want to do directly. Right? I think this is true in the, the liberty of contract era, it's true in the era of, uh, of the Warren Court with desegregation and the advancement to the extent that they were advanced of African American civil liberties. Uh, it's true today, right? It's true with, with respect to the uh, Republican right uh, agenda with respect to deregulation, the, the stripping away of constraints upon certain kinds of administrative power uh, and the encumbrance of other forms of, 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 of regulatory authority, right? So I'm not sure that focusing upon the justices' incentives is necessarily the right way to think about this, because over time, what has driven, what has driven the exacerbation of judicial authority, right, which I think everyone has said as being, has described in some way, shape, or form in negative terms, is the incentives of political branch actors, right? And the thing that I think we, we all sort of struggle with and, and, and argue with is, well, how do you find a stable way of, 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 of locking it down that arms race, right? And I, I think that the disagreements on the panel in some fashion are, are about, well, we're, we're just not sure how to defang that contest. But I don't think it's a matter of trying to do it at the level internally to the court. But I, I want to ask a follow-up question to that because that makes me, the question makes me think of things, again, as a reporter, as a follower of the court in a different way. We tend to say, oh, it's an even number of justices. They're not going to pick any big cases. It's going to be a you know, slow term. Look at how few certs have been granted. Is that a bad thing? No, sounds, sounds awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my, my, I have heard uh, scholars who, who, who are very close watchers of the court across the whole range of opinions they issue say that the 4-4, the, the, uh, the, the eight-member court, 
functioning in the wake of the Garland debacle actually looked like it was working extremely hard to make that function. I would rather see an even-numbered court than see a lot of 5-4 decisions. So if you're not going to come to a supermajority requirement, we're probably better off with an even court. But to get there, you need politics. Right? You need the political branches to add one seat. Or you need them to block the next appointment. Right? So you need, right. Right. It, right. The, the real problem is, not, is, is, hap is happening off stage. It's not happening right. in the court. Right. 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 OK. Right here in the middle. Yep. Right here. Hi, uh, John Nader, Data Society. My question to the panel is, uh, how would you have predicted the hypothetical Supreme Court case that some envisioned had Obama installed Merrick Garland, to whatever extent he had that power, suggesting that under the legal concept of waiver, the Senate had waived its uh, duty or its right for advice and consent? Had that happened, and had that been advanced to the Supreme Court? What do you think the mer how do you think the merits of that would have played out? I heard uh, there was one op-ed that suggested it would have been reasonable to say 90 days or 100 days or 120 days is the time within which you can advise and consent, Senate. A waiver issue. Well, I'll just say that I did not think that the Senate uh, behaved, that what they did was unconstitutional, but I thought it was pure power politics and it opens the door to, if Democrats control the Senate, not confirming any judge or justice from here on in, right? While well, there's a Republican president, this is the tit-for-tat problem we've been, we've been talking about. I'll just say for, it, it's essentially a joke, although I didn't know that she was trying to, trying to joke when she wrote it. Dahlia Lithwick, who I respect a lot, said, Garland should put on a robe and go sit in the ninth seat on the court and start judging cases. <laughs> and it was sort of, you know, we say we can't get around what McConnell did. Well, <laughs> nothing stopped him from entering the building. But, um, you know, we're not there yet, nor would I want us to be. But does that bring yeah. up another question? Because what I would think of is if that were to happen, there would be a challenge to it. And then who would decide the U.S. Supreme Court? I mean, is, is this a circular problem? This, this goes to, to Bob's point, right? You know, so will Merrick Garland recuse himself? And there's no rules about whether or not he has right. to. They don't fall. So, you know, exactly. maybe he can decide his own, his own case. Right. OK, we're going to go to this side here uh, in the way, way back. Uh, Jeff Hauser, Revolving Door Project. Um, I'm curious that the Russia investigation and Mueller has not come up at all. Um, when I think about the legitimacy of the Kavanaugh and Gorsuch appointments, I think much more about the possibility that the election, which put Trump into the White House, uh, had crimes committed and thus the appointments were illegitimate because they are the forbidden fruit of crimes, seems to me a much better argument than saying constitutional hardball on Merrick Garland is uh, so aberrant. And to me, the, the consequence would be that you would uh, suggest to Kavanaugh and Gorsuch that after a criminal conspiracy is proven, if that were to occur, that they need to step down or else they will be packed into obsolescence and give them the choice. So you're not packing as a first option. You're not saying we want to go to 11 because we dislike the Supreme Court. You say we would like to return to nine justices appointed by presidents who won at least the term in which they made the appointment, because I'm also aware of some Bush v. Gore issues uh, when Roberts and Alito were in 2005 and six. But anyway, does anyone want to comment on the significance of the Russia investigation? So, 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 so look, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I think this, at, le at least in my opening comments, I think, you know, the way you've framed it um, uh, f feeds into, into that in part, which is part of the court's legitimacy problem is about half of the people in the country who pay attention to, to, to politics um, will think the court is legitimate on a variety of grounds. Um, if the Mueller investigation moves in a direction along the lines that you suggest, um, those people will probably think that they have an additional ground to, to object. Um, people who disagree with them on a variety of issues will not think that. Uh, and this is the problem that the court has, in part, is about half the people who pay attention to this stuff are going to think that the institution um, is, is not legitimate. And that's a serious problem for, uh, for, for all of the members of the court and, I think, for our society as a whole. I, I think that the kind of argument that you've just articulated is unlikely to prevail for a number of reasons. But it's, it's, it's the kind of argument, just building on something Amanda said, that once it's in the public sphere, it's, it's part of the repertoire of arguments 
that make other kinds of reform easier, right? It's, kind of, it's one of the arguments that makes, say, expanding the court to 10 or 11 or stripping jurisdiction, or uh, I've written in the post about having a different mechanism for testing uh, misconduct uh, uh, allegations. Um, uh, it, it's, it's one of the, the, the rhetorical devices through which the domain of the politically possible gets advanced. And, uh, it, and that, is, that is so, even if what you've just said, I think in my view, is probably unlikely to happen. It's, un it's outside the bounds of what we now think of as, as political. Although maybe that, that view on my part is the pathological failure of a left-wing academic to play hardball. All right, I want to get to as many questions as possible, so let's lightning round this. Sure. Todd Tucker, Roosevelt Institute. Um, Lee Epstein and, and uh, co-authors have done some studies recently that say show that the Roberts Court is not only the most pro-business conservative majority, but indeed the sort of the, the 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 liberal minority is also more pro-business, more anti-worker, more pro-arbitration, et cetera, et cetera, uh, than we've seen liberal justices be in the past. Should there are we doing a good enough job uh, ideologically vetting uh, the the justices that Democrats put forward? And, and, and if not, what, what would be some, some things that we should be vetting for more aggressively in the future? Uh, well, you know, I, I went through, I was White House counsel during the, uh, the nomination confirmation of Elena Kagan. Um, I'm not sure, the, the reason I'm, I'm pausing, I'm having trouble addressing your question, I'm not quite sure, those labels are very broad, so I'm not quite sure what lies behind them. I think it's, right now, if you would ask somebody, say, and tell me if I'm wrong, in the, uh, in the academic community, what kind of a justice is Elena Kagan? Somebody would say she's a progressive justice. What kind of a justice is Sotomayor? Well, she's a progressive justice. Your suggestion is yes, maybe in some respects, but not in others, but without knowing exactly what you're talking about, I think every president, uh, obviously, and, and this goes again to the question of, you know, should presidents be able to influence the course of the court for 40 years with the number of Supreme Court appointments and the vagaries of the vacancies being what they are, set that aside for a moment, all presidents look to uh, nominate justices who they believe capture in some way and reflect a constitutional vision that that president perhaps has even campaigned on but believes it's appropriate for the Supreme Court of the United States. And I think that's taken very seriously, and, and the prior records of these nominees are, are, uh, are vetted very, very closely. So if, if, the, if the assessment was, say, in the Obama administration for Sotomayor and Kagan, um, the vetting wound up uh, resulting in the nomination confirmation of justices who have positions on constitutional issues that seem inconsistent with what you would expect from nominees of Barack Obama. I'm not quite sure what lies behind that, but, you know, I would only tell you, I think the vetting process is, for the purposes that I described, um, a very serious one. Obviously, by the way, does not include, and there's again another norm, another norm, does not include, and a norm, by the way, that I believe is, for a lot of reasons, being circumvented now, and I think predictably, goes to your question about the list, the Federalist Society saying, trust these people, or imagine in the future, a progressive organization shall remain nameless, saying, what about these people, right? Um, that you would not say to a justice as part of the vetting process, I was never anywhere, never heard such a conversation. If you had to vote on this issue, how would you vote? If you had had to vote on X, Y case in the past, how would you have voted? The norm suggests that's an inappropriate inquiry. Uh, but I do think, by the way, that is falling by the wayside through the circumvention tactics that I think, given the role the court plays in society, are inevitable. So can, let me broaden the question in a way out of the Supreme Court and, and just say something about the federal courts in general. You know, one, one of the issues about judges on the federal courts um, is what backgrounds they come with. And, you know, as Amanda said earlier, it's just psychology that you take on some of where you come from and what you do and who you represent and where your values are, especially if this has been going on in a certain profession or sector for years or decades, um, even more so. Um, and there have been a variety of studies, uh, for example, that show that a lot of different aspects of the legal profession are severely underrepresented uh, on the courts. Uh, public defenders, labor lawyers, plaintiff side, consumer lawyers. Um, it, there are a lot of prosecutors, a lot of corporate lawyers uh, on the courts. Um, there are a lot less, a fewer of these other kinds of backgrounds. 
Um, so th there's an element of experiential diversity that is is helpful. That's also not necessarily ideological in the way in the way that you mentioned, um, but is just that the legal profession is extremely broad and covers quite a variety of things, um, and the idea that only corporate lawyers or prosecutors, and especially only corporate lawyers and prosecutors you know, who worked in the executive branch in the case of the Supreme Court, or went to Harvard and Yale, or clerked on the Supreme Court, or something like that, are all that the legal profession um, has to offer uh, to the legal system, uh, is a very myopic way of seeing it. There's just a lot more out there, and I think you know, diversity in, in a lot of these different ways um, could significantly help uh, the courts as a, as a broad matter. As a state school uh, undergrad alum, I agree with that assessment. Let's go to this <laughs> side. Right here, right here. Hi, uh, Brianna Gray uh, from The Intercept and a former lawyer. I am interested in this ideological question um, because it seems like the right, when you look at like the Federalist Society, for example, uh, their uh, framing device and the emphasis on textualism and originalism not only serves their political interest, it also serves, um, or rather, it not only serves their, their kind of um, legal pro-corporate interest, it serves their broader political interest insofar as it's, it's a really easy se sell to the public. It seems... Um, natural and foundational to say we're just looking to see what the Constitution says we're not inventing law out of whole cloth and people who don't necessarily understand the law and who aren't tuning into conferences like these are able to say hey I'm not sure what the agenda is but it makes sense that I would just want to read the law from what it says in the Constitution from the from the it, it, we all understand that's pretextual but it seems to me that the left when I ask questions about you know what's what's our project what's the the kind of ACS's messaging uh, when they try to push back against the Fed Sox uh, agenda is, well, we want law, you know, we want um, laws to protect and benefit everyone and marginalize people and things like that. Right, I think we, I think we get the gist. We're, we're about to run out of time, so I just want to give everybody a chance to respond to it. What about that divergence in messaging on, from the left and the right? Well, conservative justices are not consistently originalist or textualist. Indeed, in the most important constitutional domains, they abandon those principles, uh, particularly in the First Amendment and in the uh, equal protection domain. So I, I, it's not clear to me that the labeling or the kind of the war of, of uh, the war over how to uh, market constitutional adjudication is, is all that important. Uh, because even the, even, even the, in cases like Janus or in cases like Fisher, the, the, the union speech and the uh, affirmative action cases, uh, there's no pretense at doing originalism. There's no pretense at doing textualism. So um, I'm, I'm not convinced that that kind of public relations game really matters in the end. Okay, well, uh, we've reached the point that I'm going to ask you all to join me uh, in thanking not only ACS and New America, but also Aziz, Bob, Amanda, and Ganesh for this discussion. Thank you all so much. <laughs>